The democratization of the learning experience means many things to many people and is a concept that has featured prominently on my show since the very beginning, like a pillar of purpose. It is a fresh and exciting place to be, and the question still is, what will you do with it? What will you do with the knowledge of the world in the form of a smartphone in your pockets? You get to use the tools and the access you have to play an active part in choosing what or who accompanies you on your learning journey. And I get to follow through with what I like to call my usual relaxed accessible human approach to your learning experience. Now, for this launch of Season 4, Episode 51, I will be interviewed on my own show by none other than the illustrious Estefania Fernandez, an educational entrepreneur with a strong sense of social responsibility, a woman of action whose claim to fame speaks for itself. I also want to take this opportunity to extend a special shout-out to all the show guests who have accompanied me on my learning journey which has, in and of itself, now come to be known as the English Coach Podcast. This is a heartfelt token of gratitude to all the show guests and all the listeners who have in fact helped me here to meaningfully and purposefully take ownership of my own voice by giving it away. If you are new to the show and are interested in knowing who these people are, Check out the show notes for this episode at www.trainingtree.de slash podcast or englishcoachpodcast.com. This still fresh and exciting democratization of the learning experience of which I speak also means that all the other independent trainers and coaches out there also get to make their own stage. Please support them. This show has always been about one human being talking to another deliberately personal, inclusive and unapologetic of all the perfect imperfections that make all of us the wonderful works in progress that we are. The show is still for the most part self-sponsored and independent, open to everyone but not for everyone. I'm a trainer, sometimes a coach, and in keeping with the tradition of podcasting that I have elected to honour, I still want you to feel that this show is by people and for people, and that with a small win is always a good way to begin. So do enjoy the episode, and without further ado, on with the show. Thank you for yeah inviting me to participate in this podcast. I'm honored that it's been a year. I'm honored to be here in the anniversary. And uh, talking about uh, what happened one year ago, I received this uh, message today. It's basically a silly WhatsApp message saying exactly a year ago today, there was a Chinese person buying a bat in a market in Wuhan for a soup. Yeah, that's actually, as in retrospect, that's a little bit funny when mm-hmm. I think about it, but um, but still very serious. I am just glad that a year ago I wasn't buying bats or bat wings to make funny soups or anything, but I was taking the chance to start this podcast. I remember back then a friend of mine from the Ukraine said, well, just start it because once you start it in a few months, you will be happy that you did. And today I am very happy that I did start. So... So I think we can do, maybe you can explain a bit, a recap about the lessons learned of one year doing podcasts. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the lessons have been so numerous. I really don't know where to start. Where can I start? Well, do you know, do do you want to be a little bit more specific or you want me to just dive in? Okay, let's let's go step by step. Mm -hmm. First of all, why did you start? Why what did pushed I start? you to, um, yeah, saying like, oh yeah, I, I can do a podcast. All right. Now, you know, this is my show and I'm going to be very honest. Um, I've always celebrated honesty and, you know, what we all like to call these days authenticity. 
And um, to be honest, there are many reasons, but one of the main reasons was to offer a way for my learners, my past or present course participants, to offer them a way to hold on to their language skills. It is part of the promise that I make to them as a trainer that I would give them a way to hold on because a lot of us do language courses. We pay for a month, two months, three months, and then at the end of the course, the language school says, bye, and they say something like, read a book, try to practice. They don't give you really anything to help you to hold on to the language from my experience. And um, one of the reasons for me doing this show was to offer my course participants a way to stay in contact with the language in a fun and interesting way. That is one of the reasons. Another reason, and I, I try to be brief on this, is that since the very first episode, I spoke about what I like to call the democratization of the learning experience. And what that means is that we all have the world of knowledge in our pockets in the form of our smartphones. And back then in 2019, I actually wrote also a lot of blogs on the fact that we have so much knowledge in our pockets and still what most of us do with our smartphones and social nets and so on is rubbish, you know. And um, I said that a few times and of course, you know, I mean, it's either people don't take it seriously or even if you do it on a platform like Instagram, oh, you know, we're on Instagram for fun or we're on Facebook, we don't want to think about anything, you know, we just want more and more rubbish. So I stopped doing that and I said, all right, fine, I'm not going to say it, I'm going to try to be it by doing this right being that difference that i imagine and um you know i'm sounding probably a little bit philosophical right now and that's because i'm i'm thinking reminiscing and so on and um this whole democratization just to cut it short is also about taking the opportunity to use the internet in one of the ways that it should be used to share knowledge and to put my personality out there, you know, that's um, that's one reason. Interesting. So when you started, um, how did you do it? Like, did you research on YouTube how to create your podcast or mm -hmm. did you have a mentor or someone who helped you to, you know, like mm -hmm. we're sitting here mm -hmm. in, in your a room mm -hmm. and yeah so everything is calculated mm -hmm. and and check uh, you know to have the best quality of sound so mm -hmm. yes 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 i understand i understand i think well i think i understand the question yes i did have a mentor of sorts but um again to be perfectly honest i wouldn't say that it was just one it was uh, quite a few coming back again to this democratization of the learning experience that I spoke about earlier. Part of that is the spirit of DIY. And DIY, you know, as we all know, means do it yourself. And um, I feel very strongly about that because I am also a language learner. I'm teaching English here to people who are learning it as a second language, not just as somebody who has this language and, and thinks that he has to give it to the world, but also as someone who himself has struggled with learning a foreign language as an adult. Um, I know the pain of having learned a language and I went through, I didn't attend so many classes um, of, uh, let's say, formal classes. Most of my language learning was done by talking to people, reading books, watching films, taking part in activities and living the language. And that is why that's a part of the name of my podcast. So... The question, as in which mentor, or if I had mentors, and if I used YouTube, yes, of course I did. The the DIY um, aspect of this democratization that I speak about is um, very strong, which means that you go online and you look for it and you find it and you do it yourself. And there's so much free stuff online right now, right? I mean, I used YouTube. There was one guy, you know, to be fair, I have to say, there's one guy called Pat Flynn that I followed quite a lot. He's an Indian guy based in America. I would recommend anyone doing a, a podcast to listen to Pod Flynn, 
Pat Flynn. Listen to Pat Flynn because he's good. He knows what he's doing. Of course, he's always selling something. But um, his way of he gives away lots of stuff as well. He gives you the real value that he promises to give you more of if you pay. So from that, I learned quite a lot. Yeah. Okay. Question. Is the podcast a um, kind of source for business or does it help you also? It's like personal branding, like some podcasts have sponsors, right? Mm -hmm. um, some people, I mean, there are different reasons why people do podcasts, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in, in your opinion or in your case, do you because basically you're a language trainer so do you get also more um clients more students because of the podcast or is it like somehow something that you can recommend for example if i want to create a podcast you know to support like my business or so would you recommend this is like a good strategy yes well you know i'm gonna answer this question this way I think any great thing in life is driven by a cause and not necessarily by a desire to make money. And I've thought long and hard about this, whereas yeah, I'm like, you know, to make a podcast is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of preparation. You're in the studio now. You can see there's equipment. There is all the setups. There's a the configuration. There is the editing and all of that. There's a lot of work that goes into it. But to be honest... The podcasting is driven by a cause. And I gave you two reasons there. The first reason was to help my people to hold on to the things that they've learned. The second one is in keeping with what I like to call the democratization of the learning experience. Whereas I want to live the example of using the tools that exist to learn and to enrich not just my life, but the lives of others and to touch these lives. So... First and foremost, it is it is driven by a cause. It is you have to love it. You have to love it because even if you go into podcasting for the money of it, that's not gonna happen until years afterwards. And if people don't feel a kind of passion that you have to deliver, even maybe years. I'm now at uh, episode thirty-seven. I just did, and um, I'm not really making money from the podcast, but indirectly, people know who I am. Mm -hmm. What my voice does out there and what it does help me with indirectly, the decision, the purchase decision that people have to make when they meet me as a trainer and I say to them, or let's say they see a flyer or a website that says, I am offering you action-based learning or business English that's specifically made for your firm and all these things. You know, people take these narratives. Everybody is offering that, right? And... um. What I do is I put my voice out so people can know who I am first. They hear my voice. They know that, well, this person speaks English and I understand what they're saying. This person has a way of thinking or a way of living and interacting with people that I can relate to. And they arrive at the purchase decision quicker because they have already met me. So that's the third reason why I put it out. Yeah, so it's like a, an indirect introduction of who I am, mm -hmm. right? But it is not an advertisement to buy a course. I, so I personally believe, uh, as you know, I have a meetup and I don't do it for money neither. Uh, but it's true that thanks to my meetup, people got to know me and I got also like job offers or like... Um, The people, the MBTs that I have in my uh, meetup also, they get some um, contracts, you know, and, and so on. So that's, that was what I was meaning. Uh, I think what it brings you to offer, basically you offer something for free also, uh, not only because of this cause and everything, but something that you mentioned, the third point, I think it's called trust. Good. And trust about knowing who are you so that's actually in my notes who is ian antony patterson <laughs> <laughs> ian antony patterson who i am who are oh, you oh my goodness and why the voice you have a beautiful voice by the way thank you um yeah another question not only who are you but why podcast and not video 
Hmm. Uh, you know, that's that's a, that's a very good question as well because um, now who I am or who am I? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I had a. I'm not gonna call any names of uh, at all, but um, you know, I had the privilege of having a lasting and meaningful relationship with a wonderful young lady. And I remember on some days, you know, we never got married, but I remember some days I got up and I said, well, mm, you know, not being married means that you get up every day and you decide to continue to be with each other afresh, anew, every day. Who I am, one of the other things that I used to kind of be playful with this young lady about was the fact that... You can't really say who you are. I, I don't think any, any any healthy growing personality. The idea that, you know, you you create yourself new almost every single day. It's the same way you, you get up and you decide who you are every day and you, you know. So in, in answering that question, I would be very careful in saying, well, I mean, because, you know, there are people who who will say, well, you know, OK, this is who you are. And they hold you to it as if you're a politician. Right. I am not a politician. I maintain the right to either change who I am whenever I want. You know, I mean, I make no promises to no one. But, you know, the question is reasonable. Who am I? You know, I won't get too philosophical there, you know, because that never ends. But um, in short, I would say I'm a language trainer of adults who uses rich media to enrich the learning experience of my course participants and also to reach people, other people, maybe people who have never been my course participants in any way, so that they are either inspired to take part in this learning community or maybe even one day interest themselves in a course. Uh, so that's that's who I am, I would say. I'm also, I do lots of things. As a who I am, I really can't say who I am. I can tell you the things I do. But to be honest, you know, I mean, I've been trying to find out who I am for a long time. <laughs> I, I can't I can't really answer. I can tell you what I do, you know? Well, I think what we do tells a lot about, about who you are. That's on one hand. On the other hand... Well, you know, who you are is basically um, we all have, first of all, a personality and a cultural background. And of course, you decide who you are and um, in every moment, sometimes I think sometimes we are not who we want to be because we are all affected by external circumstances too, Mm -hmm. Uh, emotions or yeah. But in general, we have an essence. So that's basically, yeah, the, the thing. Like you can be an um, extroverted, introverted person. Um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you don't have to go into detail. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very interesting question. You know, I mean, it's not a question that I would brush under the carpet or brush aside. It's a very interesting question. I I somehow suspected that such a question might come. Mm-hmm. But you know to be again to be perfectly honest, you know what I mean, I'm not a politician. I'm not looking for anybody's votes, you know. I'm not going to say to you that this is what I am X today and on that basis you should either pay me or vote for me. Yes, I'm not a politician. I I maintain, yes, I will always claim the the right to evolve. And you are right in saying we all have a background. I have a family. I have a culture. Um, I have things that I do. You as well. And um, some of us more than others, some of us more than others, will identify very strongly with either what they do or, or where they come from. And sometimes these people have nothing else. You know, I mean, sometimes when people, I meet people on the street and then this question comes some, a lot. Um, Und was magst du denn so? Yeah, so? What do you do? And this tends to come from some, you know, older German ladies. And then I like to say, ich bin Steuerzahler, you know, I'm a taxpayer. And then 
in some ways, that's who I am. And it's not it's not sarcasm or cynicism or anything. I mean, as far as the tax office is concerned, that is who I am. I'm a number. I'm a taxpayer. Yes. If um, if I meet, let's say, a model, yes, uh, someone who's interested in photography, he or she, as far as they are concerned, I'm a photographer. And if I tell them I'm a trainer, then they're confused. Or if I tell a trainer that I'm also a photographer, sometimes they get confused as well. And we should allow ourselves, I think, space to be all of these things and not cage ourselves into any role. Also, I understand two things here. So one thing is what you do that is propose that mm -hmm. could be, sorry, propose with my Spanish accent. Huh? I love your Spanish accent. Uh, propose, correct mm -hmm. me, please. Propose. Mm -hmm. Purpose. Purpose. Yes. Purpose. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, so purpose could be uh, also could kind of define you as a person right because it means what what moves you or what was your will yeah it's it's a huge topic uh, in general right it's huge it's huge yes you know i could i could also ask you i mean you are here as an honored well in a way i'm a guest on my show mm -hmm. yes but while we're here i could also take the opportunity to ask you okay who are you Mm. Yes. Well, hi. Please tell 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 our listeners. Uh, so, are. do you want the answer for whenever I present myself professionally, or whenever I present myself? <laughs> ah, so you're now making a distinction. But you see, that's that. This is yeah. this is exactly the yeah. kind of attitude that I want. For example, no. Yes, we're on my show. Yes, this is where we relax. If you want to be professional and a little bit stiff, it's fine. We can laugh about it together, yes? And then we proceed to be stiff and professional. Or you can just tell me who you are. You know, the person who likes to cook, for example. I am a person who likes to cook. Uh, yeah, and uh, as you say, that's something. You can be... So you have an essence, and then you can be different persons in different, um, you know, um, uh, periods in your life, right? Mm -hmm. So who am I? Um, it... it I think it took me a while to understand who am I. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's still a definition um, going on because, you know, you, life life is also short on one hand. On the other hand, it's long. So you have different experiences. And in my case, um, so I'm a Spanish person, expat. I live in different countries. And as you... This is something important for me. I, I, for many years, I didn't have an identity in terms of like professionally because I also do many things. I've been an entrepreneur. I've been an uh, employee, freelancer, uh, even check, uh, played with cooperatives and different things. You know, I also did um, docus, uh, travel documentaries. Um, I don't know. Like I, I've done so many things. I try, I, I, I work it on tourism and uh yeah now basically i'm uh, in education so i am an entrepreneur lecturer and um, i would say also like connector that's my essence and this is what i think who i am i'm really good at connecting dots and connecting people and being very creative coming up with ideas that you know i think we all have a kind of creativity that we use in different senses and my case is more like business even if people don't think that business is an art for me it is it is um yeah you have to be very creative you have to play you can you have to use your imagination and so on and my purpose uh, right now is um And that's something why uh, I do the meetups. And today, basically, I was with a, a colleague who organizes with me these meetups. And we were talking about the propose, what we want to do in the, and why, why we are going to also grow this community. It's because we have an interest to show people what really in innovation is, business model innovation, basically showing people or breaking this status quo and fostering another new mindset for creating new, more sustainable and responsible businesses, mm -hmm. not the old-fashioned uh, uh, way of thinking of 
yeah, I want to, you know, create a business to get myself rich and that's it. But basically we're in this world for living as good as we can and make people happy around us and like improve the life of others. Then, um, yeah, um, my, I had another question for you. What were you dream, uh, when you were a kid? Where you, you know, I, I'm uh, okay. I, I formulated this, um, question in a wrong way. Mm -hmm. You know, here we are now. Yes. And were you imagine mm -hmm. yourself you? being here at this point you know like where you if if let's say we meet the ian uh 10 years old ian mm -hmm. and 10 years old ian is seen ian here right now mm -hmm. um yes. what do you think that the 10 year old boy will think like hmm. about you know hmm. what was the vision that you <laughs> had and How will this boy react if he sees you here doing podcasts in Berlin? Well, you know, I'm going to tell you this, and it's not, it's not, a, it's not a joke. I have, I have two recurring dreams, and there was, well, actually, one I don't have anymore, and I'm going to tell you about it. And the second one is, uh, yeah, I always dream that I have some major exam coming up in one day, and I didn't study for it. <laughs> That's one recurring dream that I have. Um, there is another recurring dream that, um, I am walking maybe to the bus station or the, the supermarket. And then I look down and I notice that I forgot to put on my pants. That is a second one, which is something I will dare to talk about. I don't care. Um, but I don't have that dream so much. Sometimes I do. But the third most interesting dream that I used to have as a child And I used to tell my parents about it. I didn't know what it meant. I always imagined myself. I had this dream of me being in a room at a table talking to like five different people. But the funny thing is, there's one person made out of wood, one person made out of metal, one person made out of rubber, one person made out of plastic, and all these different people made out of different things. And I used to have that quite a lot when I was a, was a, yeah, at least five. You know, as I said, wood, metal, rubber, um, Uh, different different materials and I don't know what it meant it was just a room round table me sitting at the table with all these people and we're talking about things I don't know what we're talking about but all these people were made of different okay. materials I don't know 10 years ago I don't know if I would have been doing this but I somehow sensed that I would put myself in a position where I meet different kinds of people and give them space to be what they want to be okay first of all one thing is dreaming of like uh yeah and then the other things um what your dreams me you know like yeah <laughs> the, the, first of all there is a dictionary of dreams so i highly recommend you to go there and check yeah yeah, yeah. maybe i should check that before i publish this episode yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> could be second are you 20 because you say i said the 10 year old boy and then you say 10 years ago did i say 10 years ago yeah. no i'm not 20 i'm not i'm not 20 you know i found an age that i like you know and that age is 30 plus you know that age is just wonderful uh, yeah you know, someone I'm who said to me yeah, exactly you know 30 plus is like the perfect age mm -hmm. you at this age you you learn how to appreciate things you people start people start taking you seriously Mm -hmm. As of 30, I'm sorry, you know, for all my 20 year olds here or whoever is listening who is under 30. But people really start taking you seriously mm -hmm. at 30. So 30 plus a wonderful age to mm -hmm. have. So, you know, when you get there, you, you just hold on to it for as long as you can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Good. But yeah, so you were sure that you wanted to become a trainer, a coach. But I wasn't sure. No, 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 no. You know, I don't think I answered your question properly. No. As about the dream and, and, and where I s saw myself um, now 
you know, as a 10 year old child, of course, I didn't see myself as a podcast. I don't think there were podcasts at that time. But um, I did imagine myself being in a position where I would, well, now I'll use these words with my new vocabulary, give stage to different kinds of people, people with different backgrounds, people with different views, people with different makeups. Yes, plastic, rubber, steel, whatever. And um, and we'd be able to sit at a table and talk to each other. And this was a recurring dream. I used to have it all the time as a child. It wasn't a, it wasn't a scary dream. I mean, these people made of all sorts of materials were were a little bit, you know, off-putting. But since I knew them, uh, yeah, uh, it wasn't so scary. Uh, my parents are teachers, as it were. My father was a, tra- a teacher. My mother was a teacher. So um, we love to talk about what people have in their blood. If there's anything I have in my blood, it's definitely that. Yes, because um, we had a very close neighbor who was a teacher. I was always surrounded by people who give knowledge and um, maybe it also even affects the way I talk, right? But um, somehow I knew that I'd end up being that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's um, something to do, again, with the personality and the identity. I, I think the uh, profession uh, give us a lot of identity to ourselves, I think. Even if you do different things, but there is one recurrent thing that may be like for example, uh, helping others, you know, uh, that that's one thing. So, yeah, good. And um, I would like to ask you, actually, so I asked you already who you were also, or like what were you dreaming of when you were 10 years old? Now the question is, how would you imagine with, you know, 30 years more? 30 years from now? Yeah. Retirement in Germany or uh, like as a good German, I'm from Spain, mm-hmm. I want to live in Germany, but as a good German, I, I would like to retire in Spain. <laughs> ah. Well, yeah. you know, to be honest, I haven't really thought about that, you know, I haven't thought about that. As a, I like, I like Europe, you know, I came here to study and I finished and then there was an opportunity to try to, to either find a job or make a job for yourself. I ended up making a job for myself. I've been doing that ever since to varying degrees of success. There have been difficulties along the way. There are still difficulties. And um, things are coming together nicely now. Um, if you know, For my subscribers to the show, they will definitely hear how things are developing nicely. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that. However, in terms of where I see myself in 30 years, I... Well, to be honest, I don't I don't have kids right now. I don't know what will happen. I do have a cat, a wonderful cat called Kitty, Kitty Puss. And she's wonderful. You know, she kind of keeps me on the straight and narrow, keeps me on my toes. I feel responsible and um, I want to give her a good life. But I don't know how my responsibilities will change as things develop. Where I see myself in 30 years, I hope that... This stage that I've created, this this learning space um, for people to learn. And, you know, I mean, even though I'm a trainer, I can't teach anything. I create a space for learning to happen. The participants decide if learning happens or not. Now, I would like to see this space evolve. I would like to see more people give themselves permission to unfold in the language, whether it be English, you know, I mean, there was a time when I also offered in my little Bildungseinrichtung, Deutsch as well, even French and Spanish at some point. I wasn't doing it myself, but, you know, I would like to see that evolve into different things. Now we've also started, or I've also started offering courses for people who want to use their language to do something with it. I always say, if you're learning a language to do something with it, do something with it. So in this less than formal space where I give people the space to relax, I invite others to come in, feel comfortable, use their language and develop it, doing something they like. It could be photography, it could be cooking, it could be dance, it could be writing, it could be painting, it could be knitting, whatever it is you want to do in your target language, you can do it. And I want to see that 
develop. And I want to continue meeting interesting people. And I do not want to be trapped in boredom because I think that is the worst hell. Mm -hmm. What about now I'm thinking something interesting, which is learning languages when you are retired, for example. That's interesting because what what is the average age of your audience or your students? The average age of my audience, I'm not quite sure. I can tell you where most of them are. So most of them are now in Germany. Slowly, I'm getting more and more in China. Yeah, I spent some, invested a lot of time getting into mainland China. You know, that's a process in itself. So the show is growing there slowly. Um, there was a huge jump in listenership from India that I found very interesting. So, you know, um, for other people in India... In Jamaica, I would say big love. You know, I like the engagement. Keep on keeping on. I will, you know, bear your listenership <laughs> in mind when I also put courses together. I don't really know the age so much, you know, in answering the question of, of the listenership. I know where they're from. However, in terms of the the clients, my learners range from... I would say about 25 to 60. I, to be, again, perfectly honest, it's a place for honesty. I wouldn't recommend anybody to start learning a language at 60. If you already have it in your system and you want to reactivate it with some activities and, um, you know, something fun, some theater, some drama, some painting, some photography, some whatever activities, travel maybe, um, then you can try However, learning a new language, I am not quite sure. I mean, I I started learning German at a at a late age, and it was a real challenge. Um, I didn't learn in a conventional way because you know you go into a class. Sometimes you have a trainer who is also themselves trained to train in a certain way, and sometimes it doesn't exactly fit to let's say the adult learner who has to be taught in a different way. You have to. You can't just say to an adult learner, this is the rule. You have to give the adult learner the chance to navigate and sort these new rules to rules that they already have. You have to teach an adult learner differently. And when I started learning learning German, I was an adult learner and the, the formal classes didn't work. So I had to find my own way and I paid the price for it. Yeah, and it took a long time, but um, it was a different approach. In answering the question, I think I answered the question already, the average age, mm -hmm. 25 to 60. And I really wouldn't recommend anyone at 60 to start learning a new language, to be honest. Uh, yeah, but as you said, and I learned different languages too, and also not like... Did you start at 60? What did you start learning at What no, I started. <laughs> I did learn different languages, not as you know, not, not that old. Sorry. Anyway, um, mm. so in my experience, I agree with you. First of all, we have this elasticity, elasticity of the brain, right? That will not work the same with sixty. However, I do believe, or I try. For example, I try to encourage my parents to learn a bit of English because they feel so dependent on me when whenever we travel, you know, when when they want to travel to any other country. And at the end, you know, they come to Berlin and uh, sometimes they're, they're in my place and when I get home, they have food. I mean, they bought everything in the supermarket. They didn't have any problem with the language, right? But this the language gives you this insecurity. They feel insecure sometimes. Uh, that they will not be able to do something. And in my opinion, learning a language when you're retired, is, it could be a very good exercise for, um, you know, uh, keeping your brain active. So, I, for example, when, when I get retired, I want to, um, you know, like learn any other language and, and some kind of music also. Anything that you can learn, you can train train your your brain in this sense, I think it's good. Um, yeah, the way of learning might be different, uh, but I believe, for example, what you're doing now with this uh, training tree. Training tree dot de dot de. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Dot yes. de. So um, <laughs> that's also something cool to learn language because I, I, it happened the same to me when I when I I'm still actually learning German. 
So what I do is try to learn with music, like karaoke. Uh, it was very, basically also very good, uh, good uh, experience during the pandemia. We were like doing karaoke, like virtual with some um, German friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And you then you have to... Do you, do you remember this vocabulary because it brings you an emotion, yeah? And you're having fun too. So theater, music, dance, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, something mm-hmm. like this, I, I think is, is also interesting. Yes, That's yes. my opinion. You're right. You know, um, what we're, what I actually said, and I, you know, I'll say it again, I wouldn't recommend it still. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would recommend it. If you have it in your system already, then you can activate it. You can bring it to a new level, which is actually the essential level. Yes. By using it to do something. Right. If you use it, if you activate your language through using it, doing activities you like, for example, you could uh, uh, join a book club. A good example is, you know, the story of Pippi Langstrumpf. Yes. And you know what happens in the beginning, what happens in the middle, what happens at the end. And you then explore this in English. And then since you already have the meaning inside of you in German, and you already have a little bit of English inside. Most people have a little bit of English inside them. Then you can activate it. However, the very, very, very basics, I really still, I, I, I wouldn't, As a, anybody can try it, but you know what I mean? I, I wouldn't think that I'm the best person to help with that. You know, again, it's all about honesty. I would not, I think, take on a 60-year-old beginner. I don't think I'm qualified for that. Um, but if, if, if you are at that age and you do have a little inside of you, you can call yourself maybe A2 or something, um, you do have some vocabulary, then I'd be happy to work with with you or with them. Um, as you said about your parents as well, it's a very key point there. You know, this feeling of helplessness, is it's something that affects the adult learner more than the child learner, especially at work. Which yeah. is a very key thing. And in this case, it's basically, I think, the panic, you know. We have limit, limitation, uh, how do you say? Uh, uh, limit, Limitation limit. thoughts. Oh, yes, I understand what you mean. I think I understand. You mean thoughts that cause you to hold back or yeah, not. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what it, uh, they have. But we're talking also about different gener- uh, generations and uh, different... Uh, backgrounds right like I, I will be potentially a person more open to learn anyway other languages because I I had to learn different languages in my life rather than someone who has never moved or you know they, they, they didn't have the need to learn another language or, okay or so something. you're saying that you already you're already programmed or you have the aptitude for new languages so you think if you are if you're a you're a multilingual person and you are 60 and you start a new language then it might be easier for you i do believe once you learn so for example you have two mother tongue right well kind of yes 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 so in in, in jamaica the the official language is english 100 percent yeah however there is another well, you know, some people call it a dialect. The language specialist would say it's its own language. Um, but yes, you could say I have two. Yeah. Exactly. Same as me. Um, um, I do think, or I, I, what I have experienced is that people with uh, more than two, uh, so basically more than one mother tongue, they have kind of like, you know, like, Learning a language transforms your brain. That's, That's actually clear. proven. That is proven, yes. It has been proven, yes. Yeah. So um, I think when you learn more languages, uh, so for example, do not try to learn Italian and Spanish at the same time because, <laughs> you know, it's uh, they're too similar. <laughs> but mm-hmm. if you know, for example, if someone who speaks English and Mandarin, for example, learning German might be easier uh, than someone who only speaks one language. That's on one hand. You connect dots. You're, yeah, you're more open to learn, and you have more experience. Yeah, I definitely think that if you speak more than one language, 
you have more uh, kind of facility to learn an, a new one. Even though for me, German, I'm sorry, it's been years learning German and still not proficient in this language, but yeah. Well, you know what? Um, you're definitely correct there. There we can definitely agree because I think when you... There are some people who say that when you learn a new language, you actually develop a new personality. Um, I tend to believe that. There are some people who say that that's not the case. Um, and, you know, I like to agree to disagree with people. You know, we can always agree to disagree. We don't have to agree on everything. I mean, if we did, then the world would be a very boring place. But um, even the, 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 let's say, the worldview of someone who, who has another language is different from the worldview of another person who doesn't because you know that you recognize that sometimes there are things that you can, you recognize and you have more tolerance for the possibility of certain things not being communicated in exactly the same way in one language as it is in another. Or maybe there's even an impossibility to express the exact same thing you do not say things like, I mean, sometimes I even have people who they say, well, you know, which one is better the way we say it in German or the way you say it in English? Which one is better? Which one is which one is more efficient? You could probably ask. Yes, but that is just for a moment. They don't usually stay that way for too long. But, you know, people dance between worldviews. I think when you have more languages, you accept you're more tolerant of other ways of being and you're also open for other ways of saying things other ways of communicating you know i mean in, in even in science sometimes you say someone is here talking and 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 it's not a fact because it's not a scientific talk but you know i mean it's not just science well i have the greatest respect for science and you know scientific writing and reading and whatever there are also other ways of knowing there are things that you know from from feeling there are things that you know from just looking at someone sometimes or touching them or just the the energy in the room there are other ways of knowing it's not all scientific and um i think when you have when you have different languages you have you you have a stronger um aptitude a stronger feel for other ways of knowing other ways of seeing other ways of expressing would you consider yourself because as you say uh, a language or will it will change us a bit in terms of like, I'm thinking if I have different personalities according to the language I speak in, and mm -hmm. it can be because honestly, in, in Spanish, I'm way more smart. You know, mm -hmm. I'm smarter. You <laughs> <laughs> I sound smarter. You, so, you sound smart. Well, 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 well. And, you know, and you're true because of the people around you believe that you're smarter than you are. Of course. Of course. And they, really, I promise. It's true. You can't really know. They give you. No, it's true. You know what I mean? Yes, of course. You know, a, a professor of mine once said, you know, if enough people believe it, then it's true. And, you know, of course, you know, yeah, you know, scientifically you can say, well, that is rubbish. But, you know, look at what is happening in the States. You know, you know, I mean, I'm going to leave it at that because it's not a political show. But if a lot of people believe that you're smart, then you will start believing it. That's how horoscopes work. If all your life, let's say you're a, a, a Tauran or you're 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 a Scorpio and people are saying, well, you know, as a Scorpio, you're very vindictive and you always like to have revenge. And they've been telling you that from a baby. Are you right? Scorpio? One day it's going to be true. No, I'm not Scorpio. <laughs> okay. I'm not Scorpio. No, no, no. But I am very respectful of the Scorpions. Yes. Good. Good band. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I forgot what I was saying. No. <laughs> uh, so the, different yeah. personalities yes, in different languages. Yes, you said you were languages. smart. You said you were smart uh, in Spain, which in Spanish, in Spanish. In as es, es Spanish. In Spanish. I, <laughs> I am a smarter, of course. Yeah. And you are. You are. But, but what is it that makes you smart? What is it that makes you smart? No, no, the uh, ability? Because you are more natural in your own language. That's y the first thing. Of course. And you have more resources. You That's more a resources. fact. Like, I, I, I mean, I... I studied English since I'm a kid, since I was a kid, but that doesn't mean that I really learned English, right? Because the system, the education system was, by that time, terrible. 
So I learned language, the language by, I, in my case, I went to Glasgow, which is not the best place where to learn English. <laughs> but <laughs> but if, it's what happened to me. And mm. once you learn how to uh, understand Glaswegians, then, then it's fine. Did you happen to have a relationship there? I did. I did. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Then you had a good relationship. Then it means that, I mean, as though you had good conditions then for learning the yeah. language in a nice way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Having like a boyfriend or girlfriend, like a partner with who you have to talk this new language, it definitely helps. Yeah. Of course. For sure. For sure. I yeah. mean, it even comes down to, I mean, uh, the one of the things that I'm also kind of pushing well and not, yeah since recently is the idea of community mm -hmm. community and the idea of entering into this space that i like to talk about and forming relationships in the target language because if you meet someone in spanish Spanish, as you say. I like when you say Spanish. But um, be careful, you will end up saying Spanish. I know. I, I, <laughs> yes, it's yes. I can't forget that joke. You know that joke? When I think about that joke and I ask myself, why is it funny? I can't figure out, you know. But um, when I asked you, why do you end the word Spanish with S? And you said, because I'm Spanish. And I'm like, oh Shh. my goodness, that was so funny to me. I thought that you actually, you know what? I thought that you say, why do you say S Spanish? Because we do not pronounce S. We do pronounce E S. I know. I and know. That is what I was saying. Like, but, because yeah, I'm but from you said S Spain. I know. But, you know, it was just so funny to ah, me. It was so, so funny to me. But, you know, not in a, not in a way that I am, I am really laughing at you. I'm laughing mm -hmm. with the situation and the wonderful little gems that can happen sometimes mm -hmm. with languages and, and, you know, when you're open. But coming back to building the relationship and this space, I want to... A space. I want to... <laughs> I want to invite people to, you know, form relationships. You know, you meet someone, you come in, you know, as though there is... Well, first there is a newsletter. You know, you sign up for the newsletter and then after that you will be invited to the private learning mm -hmm. group. And um, that is a space that is ad-free, away from Facebook um, and LinkedIn and everything. And then in that space, I want my participants okay. to form languages, for form, form relationships in the target language. That, that's, that's the idea. Very interesting, because now it sounds to me, it's not only to learn a language, but may, maybe meeting a potential partner. There, there is a world of possibilities yeah. with, 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 with it. Of Good. course, you know, people coming together means people coming together. That's why I work with adults, you know, I mean, I don't have to control what people are doing when they come together. You know, my goal is that they focus on the language. And if, as long as they do it in English, I don't care. Okay. Good. Very interesting. So, let me check. Oh, yeah, we, we were talking about, um, yeah, so we have something in common. That's basically we're expats and we live in Germany, right? And um, you said also like uh, a high percentage of your audience comes from Germany. So maybe they are interested in knowing what do we believe, what do we think about Germany? So as an expat, so what is your favorite thing in like living in Berlin from the culture? Of course, I'm don't, don't, don't tell me like, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I was going to say like the, co no, actually that could happen. <laughs> Sorry. The what? <laughs> like, like German food. No, um, mm -hmm. I like German food. Don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, you know, Berlin. Berlin. Ber Berlin. 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 You know, I can't even. Yeah. You know, I like to Berlin. say Berlin, Berlin. The, the, in my Jamaican, you know. As it hawked out, you would say Berlin. Yeah. But um, I like to say. Berlin. No, yeah, yeah, but the Berlin. Germans, they Berlin. pronounce it differently. Yeah. yeah. But so, they don't say it either. Someone says Berlin. Berlin. So I, I like to say, I like to put my Jamaican speaking and say Berlin. 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 Yeah. Burning Berlin. Yeah. But um, what I like about the city is, first and foremost, there is a lot of, there's a lot of culture here. There's a lot of color. There is a lot of, and I'm not going to say multiculti, you know. I'm, I'm going to say that there are very many 
influences there were many opportunities to meet people from different cultures and that is a fantastic thing because again different languages means different world views even different sources of inspiration and i find that fantastic another thing i like about berlin is that um berlin is that uh historically berlin has more cultural offers cultural facilities than any typical um german city i think there are maybe twice as many museums twice as many art installations and activities and institutions and einrichtungen than other cities in germany i like that i like um the richness of cultures gives you diverse food types mm -hmm. diverse people cultural offerings i like the internationalness of of the city i like the fact that you can pretty much be whatever it is you want to be i find it interesting how for example the people even change the mode of dress is even different depending on what part of berlin you are people dress differently in prinzlauberg than they do in friedrichshain than they do in kreuzberg mm -hmm. And um, I find that wonderful. I also like to see the dynamic when people from other parts of Germany come to Berlin. And um, being an online trainer as well, it is also interesting to me to hear what people say about Berlin also when they have never been here. And the, the ideas they have of the city, the things that Berlin people do, you know, they say good girls go to heaven, bad girls go to Berlin. Mm -hmm. And people have all these <laughs> fantasies. I find them I'm very Abba entertaining. Sexy. I'm Abba sexy. Well, you know, yeah, it could be, could be. I'm Abba sexy. Poor, yeah, but, but you sexy. know, but arm, arm poor, you know, is a uh, relative, but actually. Sexy. Relative. It's relative. Yeah. There is one thing mm. uh, about communication. It's not only a language thing, but it's like a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. And this is something I experience a lot because I, I also work with different nationalities and I know like, and I had to train myself in this, which is basically straightforward communication. So I ask you a question mm -hmm. and then like, what is your favorite thing in Berlin? And, and you basically explain like mm -hmm. a lot, like, like. The way you explain it is longer mm -hmm. than, a, for example, a German person would be like going to the point, straight to the point. I don't know if that's true all the really? time. I don't know if that's true all the time. No. But, yeah. but in general, I had to learn about this, you know, because I'm, I'm from Spain. Mm -hmm. Again, Spain. Spain. <laughs> España. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in, yeah, and we talk a lot. Like, we, first of all, we talk a lot. We talk loud. I was not really aware of this that much before I, I live abroad. Uh, now when I'm in Spain, I I suffer even a bit, like uh, it's like so much noise, like people talking at the same time, like I get a bit crazy. Uh, and yeah, but I had to learn to speak more directly, you know, because I had f also friends and at work, uh, people telling me like, okay, don't tell me your life. Go straight to the point. And like, okay, I have to learn how to communicate and go straight to the point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Understood. So, and that is, you think that is a kind of an adaptation to the German culture? Yeah, it's, it's something that you learn from. Uh, so it's not only the language, but it's uh, also cultural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there are many reasons for that. I, I agree with you. I agree with you in some way. You know, we also like to say Germans are always um, punctual and always factual and so on and so on. Yes, not everything is true. I find no. people are people everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, there are certain truths that we give life to in terms of um, why we think so and why this, in Deutsch we say, umschweifen. Mm -hmm. you know, and not being too direct. The question as to why that happens or why, let's say, this directness is cherished here, supposedly. You know, there are many reasons. You know, historically, for example, as uh, Germany 
has had its share of, let's say, its uh, experience with, let's say, the charismatic leader. And um, maybe that is one of the reasons why they don't want any fluff around the facts, just the facts. It is also probably something that affects the kind of politics that happens mm-hmm. in Germany. The kind of politics, it's not like a, like a fire burning kind of politics, people getting all passionate and loud and everything. It's very zacklish to the point, which probably is a culture that has been nurtured more by leaders like Angela Merkel. Mm-hmm. Right, very, very sober. And um, yes, I guess to the point, and there is some advantage to that as well. But, you know, too much of that is also not so good because then then the humanness suffers, I suspect, because that is more, well, yeah, no disrespect, but more like machine language. When you just speak in ones and zeros, it is machine language. Mm-hmm. And, and um, that is not the relational that is not the softness that mm-hmm. causes you to connect with people and, and 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 see someone for example as someone special who you might want to explore a further relationship with if somebody comes to you with ones and zeros facts then that's nothing that's not inspiring yeah so um the mix that i try to find these days is i might answer directly the question quickly first and then I invite my listener to let me elaborate and then I might say well the reason why I feel this way is right so giving the answer suck first and then coloring that answer mm-hmm. a little bit yeah because uh, yeah, life as over life is not ones and zeros man mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. nay you know so again it's not a critique um, in terms of the the advantage of that way of being i'm also i I have also become more ones and zeros yeah the longer i spend in in germany and i notice that when i speak to people from my own country they're like oh you know just so quick you know and whatever and they're like yeah i couldn't finish you know can't we drink something first or or they feel actually offended when you get straight to the point because they're like you know so so what am i you know am i your keyboard you know they want to they want to know who you are and it comes again to this podcast thing because if i were to think of this in very zacklish way ones and zeros why the hell would i be doing a podcast if it's not bringing me any cash money direct why yes it's not wirtschaftlich right but i do it because you know there is there's heart involved and um and that hard thing is the soft power. That hard thing is the thing that makes a difference. That hard thing is the difference between being a commodity and being an experience. So, I mean, there are advantages and disadvantages. And uh, the, 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 the real art, I think, is probably to balance how you do and also to sense what people expect. Or sometimes you can kind of nudge them into probably, you know, developing or exploring, being tolerant of a different kind of worldview. All right, so here we are again. Yeah, mm-hmm. time for publicity. <laughs> a little bit of publicity. You are asking me about the directness and indirectness of answering. And I went on and on about the advantages and disadvantages of both, you know. May I ask you why you asked me that? The About the directness. Ah, because you talk a lot. <laughs> 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 That's maybe okay. why you have a podcast. Yes, of course. You know, that's the thing. You know, people, yeah, people, have, people who have a lot of things to say might need a podcast, and they need photography, and they need art, and they need all sorts of platforms to just talk. Sometimes they need another language. Mm-hmm. 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 to say more things okay but i have a lot of questions still okay so, good thing i like to talk okay so i do remember for example they arrived to berlin so i wanted to ask you if you can remember the day when you arrived in germany how was it and what there was the first impression, right? Because I asked you before also what 
what do you like the most about Berlin? Yeah, so that's that was the connection. And now I'm asking you if what if you can remember the f first day when you arrived in Germany and what was your first impression? And if that has changed, you know, because I do have a different vision of Berlin now than seven years ago when I, I, I arrived to Berlin. All right. You know, I'm going to take the approach that you prefer. And uh, the most surprising thing about the day when I arrived in Germany for the first time was white street people. What? Okay. Yes, that was the most surprising thing. Okay, because you were expecting in Berlin and Germany not to not to have like so many white people in the street. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, no. Let me let me let me answer again directly. Okay. The most surprising thing for me was to see white street people. Ah, okay, I understand now. Yes, I understand what you mean now. Mm -hmm. Yes, that Active was it. Active listening is uh, something I I have to improve too. I was straight to the point. I just answered. So, you know, that's it. So it's like answering it in a closed way. So, um, because we're learning also vocabulary. Mm -hmm. uh, so, auf Deutsch would be penna. <laughs> right? Well, you know, or a, like a penna, a penna doesn't have to be a street person. They're also, they're also, yes, that's what I mean. Okay. Which in, in English will be homeless. A homeless person. Okay. So, yes, white homeless people on the street. That was a shock to me. Okay. I can tell you, uh, I'm really surprised in seven years since I'm in Berlin, I see more and more uh, homeless people in general. That's something that it con I'm, I'm really concerned about this, to be honest. But yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, good. So that was the f first impression. I would say, but why white exactly? Like, you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Because, well, it's norm. It's a statistic, no? Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, like. It's normal. Oh. No. All right. Good. I gave you time as well to ask me why, which is, um, yeah, I, I hoped yeah. the, The thing is, I'm from a Jamaica as a colony. You know, it was yeah. a it was a col it was first a Spanish colony, and then the British came and mm -hmm. asked nicely mm -hmm. that the Spanish leave, and they did. Uh, but the thing is, from my world, white people belong to the ruling class, so mm -hmm. they're not on the street, mm -hmm. and that is why um, it was just a shock. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to make sense. It's just something that I had not seen before at that time and it was a shock to my system mm -hmm. i mean it was just a quick shock and i had to rush it was uh i came in at tegel airport and then i had to get to zoologische garden the the former the former tegel that's no oh longer oh my god there. that yes, doesn't exist yes, anymore yes, come on it's just a few days ago you know, i know it but it exist. sounds like so weird the I former know, airport the for but you know it's it's like... when, did, when did they close just about two weeks ago right <laughs> yeah yes okay good yeah so yeah anyway okay, sorry Came first to Tegel and then I went to Zoglok Shagatna and then I had to take a train. I had to rush to to get a train to Frankfurt Oder. And it was at night because I think I, I got here around about this time and it was it was dark. It was cold and I was very afraid. I was so afraid that I wasn't afraid anymore. And I was like numb. And um, I had also, they had also lost my baggage. Oh. So I just had my hand luggage and a pack of CDs, a pack of CDs. The bag is somewhere here. Mm -hmm. I don't see it right now, but um, it was that. That's all I had when I went to, and I had my money, of course. Yeah, so I went um directly to Frankfurt. So I didn't really have time to to sit and think about why is there a homeless white person. I had to get to the other scary experience which was the train into into blackness when was that when was that mm -hmm. that was <laughs> it was 2002 oh yes at the end of the year 2002 i think it was november 14th mm -hmm. yeah wow. november 14th 2002 oh, wow. wow so It's November. It's a special month for you. It is a special month. 
Um, it's also my father's birthday. Uh-huh. And, um, Happy birthday. Yeah, it's, it's not the 14th <laughs> anymore. It's my father's birthday. And of course, you know, the thought of it being my father's birthday was also in my mind at the time. But, you know, I mean, there were many thoughts in my mind that I didn't really have to. I didn't, I, I couldn't afford to, to, to give space to these thoughts. I just had to get onto the train and get to Frankfurt Oda. Okay, why Frankfurt Oda? Because they said, yes, I wanted to study in Europe. Hmm. When I applied to Germany, uh, I think I, I, had a, I had a good job in Jamaica, but I wanted to study in Europe. I wanted to learn a new language. Most people in the colonies tend to go to their colonial, the lands of their colonial, mm-hmm. previous colonial masters, which um, in, in our case, it would be then Great Britain or America, which is not really a master, but still, you know, <laughs> um, most Jamaicans either want to go to Britain or America. But I wanted to learn a new language. And um, to be honest, I had a kind of um, fascination with the German language because of Deutsche Welle, Deutsche Welle, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. like the German version of BBC. Mm-hmm. And um, I wanted to know, to get to know also some of the things that I heard in, you know, in history. Um, you know, we know the history. I wanted to hear it for myself. Yes, that's also one of the reasons I wanted to meet the people who made Mercedes and Volkswagen because these cars mean quality in uh-huh. my country and I wanted to meet the people who are the makers of such quality. Mm-hmm. So these are the little ideas that kind of drove the the want to study here, you know, studying here, meeting people who are, you know, known to be capable of producing that quality, learning a new language. Um, and here in Germany as well, it's not as expensive to study here as it is in the um, in the UK or in America. Okay. Well, if you go to a public university, because uh, private education is still expensive. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, so I think most of the private universities that I know here are run by the Brits, right? They have a totally different, they have a totally different um, idea mm-hmm. of yeah. uh, of that, you know. But I mean, again, advantages and disadvantages <clears throat> of mm-hmm. both approaches. I'm, I won't, you know, mm-hmm. I won't voice my critique today. Okay, so another question is because. In this break, we went through my notes. And one of the questions was like, what did you fear of? And before you answer, I'll tell you what I do fear. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you said something about homeless before. Mm-hmm. This is something I fear because I do believe being homeless, honestly, it's also a matter of luck. It's, I mean... Even if you work hard or whatever, you know, it can happen to you like a few things in life that can or or basically you have like kind of also mental problem. I believe that even if you are the smartest person in the world or whatever, something can happen to you or like basically you are you suffer from a mental illness or whatever. And then, you know, this is not that difficult. This is what I think. And for me, this will be something, yeah, that I will fear, like being a homeless or having like kind of problem like Alzheimer, something like this, to be disoriented in life. Yeah, that would be. So my question to you is, what do you fear? Okay. (laughs) What do I fear? Mm Mm-hmm. I fear nothing. No, come on. Everyone has a fear. You think so? Yeah. Even if you're brave and you have courage, you know, it's fear is part of being, like, having courage too. And that's why it's even more interesting. Yeah. You know, you know I'm going to be really honest with you. And I've, I have thought about fears... And maybe maybe it's a mark of intelligence or lack of intelligence. But, you know, to be perfectly honest, I don't fear anything. You know, the, 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 the thing is, all right, 
I'm very respectful of people. Yes. Mm -hmm. I I know that people are capable of all ends of wickedness, mm -hmm. right? So I I am fearful of what drives people, right? I am fearful of an ignorant mass of people. Hmm. Honestly, that is what I'm I'm fearful of, right? The the thing is again, I'm not going to push this too much into the politics but we see we've said earlier that you know i mean if enough people some people think that if, if enough people believe something then it's true and it is a kind of a constructivist way you know the, the um what do you call it now philosophical approach constructivist kind of thinking and then the realist would say something is and the, the constructivist would say well they you create a reality right um this what i'm sitting on is a small table and then somebody would say no it is a stool yes so that is then the constructivist constructing their own truth and um i fear an ignorant mass constructing truths that are not necessarily true that is really one of my fears because if you have you know um this is a friend of mine wrote on facebook the other day she said she said something about the crowd right she said, I think she said, um, she will never follow the crowd. And maybe something along the line of she's afraid of following the crowd. And it is not good to follow the crowd. Um, or not good to be one following the crowd. And I said, well, you know, it depends. You know, if the crowd is a lynch mob, then maybe, you know, it's better to be in that crowd and not on the other side. So... You know, I mean, as as a minority, I I read that is really one of my greatest fears, and I've seen, for example, how what is happening in the world right now, this right wave that mm -hmm. has taken the world mm -hmm. from. I personally think it started. Well, you know, I don't know when it started. You know, because I'm not gonna place blame. I do have an idea, but I'm not gonna say anything. But it is definitely a, a wave that has affected many governments around the world, governments in South America. You know, we could say the Brazils and, and, and some others, you know, also some of the European countries, you know, the Hungarys, Aust also Austria, what's also happening here with some political movements, even Brexit somehow. Mm -hmm. So when I say that I fear the ignorant mass, it's a serious fear. You know, it's not it's not it's, it's not uh, a small thing because mm -hmm. that is probably one of the most dangerous things. I mean, even in German history, we've had mm -hmm. we yeah. have had instances where there's a kind of an intoxication that can happen from a charismatic leader in a certain direction that carries a population in such a way that, you know, starts with dehumanizing of others. Mm -hmm. Right. Whether it be positive or negative but still dehumanizing and then the lynch mob. So that is, when I say to you that that is my fear, it's a serious fear, right? Mm -hmm. So that is why yeah. as well, I, that's also one of the reasons why I like the idea of being able to put my voice out. It's not, it's not just because I love to talk. It is because we should use this opportunity and be thankful of the opportunity to be able to share our voice and be able to live in a country where you are able to share your voice freely because if mm -hmm. you don't come into conversation with the idiot or even let's say i'm not gonna say if you if you don't if you don't if you, if, if you make the mistake of not ever coming into consideration with someone who somebody might consider an idiot you might be mistaken to be one right so voice even again coming back to this podcast this this whole podcast is an expression it's, it's a kind of a yeah, it's a kind of an activism against this state where you cannot influence the ignorant mass because you have voice, right? And I encourage people to, to, to use these things, use the Facebooks, use the Twitters, use the podcast um, platforms, use these things to talk to people and come into contact because that will, if we're talking to each other and we're recognizing that we're all basically the same, right then we won't then they reduces the tendency of the ignorant mass yeah and that's a fear you know as well i mean there are the fears of course you know sure. but 
but but there is not all always only one, right? There there are there are others, but you know, I mean, we don't have to go into my fears too deeply today. Yeah, like I also have other fears, but mm. I I understand what you say, and yeah, I do agree. This is very scary. Yeah. So I like the fact that look look, you know what is happening right now? I am here from Jamaica, yeah, from the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. You're from Spain, not even just Spain, but you're from um, the north of Spain. Remind me again. How I'm do you from say it pro- Galicia. properly? Galicia. Coruña. La Coruña. Yes, which is a different culture, a culture that yeah. I thought up until before I met you, I thought I knew everything about Spain, mm-hmm. even though I, I, <laughs> I didn't know. I don't know much in Spanish. I know about Barcelona, and I know that they speak Catalan, and they want to be, you know, they're trying certain things. And I know about Madrid. I've met a few dancers from Spain, mm-hmm. photographed a few of them okay, as well. And I thought I knew everything. I eat a lot of paella, and I've been to maybe one or two tapas bars, yes, and I can dance a little salsa. Oh yeah, can yes. you? Yes, of course, of course I can. Oh, okay. And okay. merengue. Okay. Can I oh. And I mean, yeah, I I thought I knew a lot, but until I met you, I didn't recognize. I have none. I have the I have the narrative. I have the vocabulary of another place in Spain that I didn't know about before, okay. and it's because we're talking to each other. We're talking to each other right sure. now. You're in front of me. I'm in front mm-hmm. of you. Yeah, actually, it's um, I think Spain is one of the most diverse countries in mm-hmm. terms of, um, yeah, because, you know, in my area, we are Celtic. So culturally, I'm more similar to an Irish person or like North, like language in, in terms of language. I'm, I'm really related to Portugal because I, we speak, uh, you know, Galego, which is. Uh, it used to be the same language uh, originally, Galego Portuguese. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, w- when people, like for example, you <laughs> think mm-hmm. of Spain and think about like flamenco, mm-hmm. that's like yeah, no, and I my think identity. That's where it ends. I thought that's yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's more. Even though my mom, for example, is from from south, so uh, but still, the, Spain has a huge influence from Arabic country. I, actually, a lot of Spanish words come from arabic yeah um and culturally yeah we have a lot of similarities uh, to the arabic culture you know so we're really mixed in in that sense like bus country it's totally different uh, like honestly the language i don't know if you have heard uh, how the basque language sounds but it's like totally different uh, uh so Ascari Casco is like to say thank you. <laughs> so like, I don't know. Really, it's so totally different. Um, but yeah, I don't know why we came to this uh, diversity, you know? Like, uh, yeah. yeah. The ability to, to be able to talk to each other. I'm talking to you yeah. from as a Jamaica living in mm-hmm. Berlin. You're from Spain. I'm learning about you. Maybe I had some strange ideas about Spanish people. But because we can talk to each other, there will not be ignorance. Yeah, definitely. And yes. I have to say, I learned a lot from Jamaica because uh, I don't think I've ever met really a Jamaican person, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. And I I think I also learned a lot from Jamaica by talking to you. And it's so interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the way you learn about people and cultures and so on. Even though I think if you are here since 2002, well, you're a bit German already, right? I am a bit German. Well, it's the end of 2002. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even usually count 2002, actually. Mm. I usually say 2003. So, yeah, I call it 17 years. We, we are already mixed, you know. And this is something, I, again, a huge topic. When you live abroad, you, you you acquire some kind of cultural aspects and you lose some and cultural identity when you're an expat, it will be uh, also an interesting topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because what is basically, uh, we talk about the cliches in Germany, right? What about the cliches from Jamaica? What mm-hmm. is what is what you hear the most when you know people meet you and then you say you're from Jamaica? Mm-hmm. What what uh, what are they saying like oh you know? 
What do they say? Yeah. Well, it's it's basically positive, and I'm 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 thankful for that. You know, mm-hmm. um, the 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 word Jamaica seems to evoke feelings of happiness and warmth and sunshine, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is a nice thing. It's a nice thing. Uh, you know, when it, normally when I when 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 I say that I'm from Jamaica, people say Jamaica. You know, and I'm like, oh, they sound so loving towards. The idea for of holidays, so it's a, yeah, like, yeah, 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 and it's not only it's relax. more more the older people because you know Jamaica had a political time there, you know, with Bob Marley and and a mm-hmm. lot of stuff happening with you know, socialism and, mm-hmm. and and so on, you know, at that time and and um, in the sixties seventies, Jamaica was big on the music scene, mm-hmm. still is, still is, but in a different kind of way. And uh, the older people have a deeper appreciation for that. The younger people, I mean, they have mostly no idea. But um, but even then, there is still the feeling of the sunshine feeling, which is good. Not all of the stereotypes are correct. Sure. Um, some of them are. Uh, a lot of them aren't. For example, one of the first things that come to people's minds is smoking weed. Mm-hmm. Which is, you know, I mean, I'm Jamaican. I have indulged, um, and I'm gonna just say that straight. But um, there have been instances where people have invited me to smoke with them, and when I refuse, and this is now funny mm-hmm. because it's mm-hmm. touching on the the positive mm-hmm. dehumanization, dehumanization, nonetheless, which is the beginning of really bad things, sometimes. Uh, this guy says, you know, come, you know, let's go smoke a fat joint together. And um, and I say, well, no, you know, I'm studying. I have to study statistics, you know, and uh, if, if I have to study, I, I, I can't smoke, you know. And then this guy would take it personally and say that I am rejecting my culture and I'm an imposter. Mm-hmm. And he would, he did. I remember the guy, I, I, I'm seeing him in front of me right now telling me, I am all ends of hypocritical oh, come and on. I am this way and I'm that way and I'm rejecting my... And he invited his friends and said, look at this guy rejecting his culture and refusing to smoke weed with me. And I'm like, my God, you know, as a... That's it was, it was, it was, that, that is, that is, that is definitely ignorance. As, and, and, you know, that's another thing, you know, these stereotypes that we have... Uh, uh, the same thing happens to also, you know, women, which is another topic for another day. You know, someone might push you into a corner and say, well, you know, I mean, okay, to be hard, this is not something I would say because I'm cooking tonight. You belong in the kitchen, for oh, example. okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, that would probably ring going? some bells. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the same thing when somebody says to me, well, you know, you smoke all the time. I know I want to smoke with you. So come smoke weed with me right now. And if you don't, then you're a liar and you're an imposter and you are fake and you are not authentic. And so, and this guy in doing that, he tries to force me into that role. And that is what will happen sometimes. Maybe you've heard some things as a Spanish woman. Maybe someone has, even other women have said, well, you know, they tell you who you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, in in this case, Are for example, try? like mm. uh, um, for example, uh, uh, there is the wrong idea of Spanish people being lazy because the most popular Spanish words are fiesta and siesta. <laughs> it's like we party all the time and then we sleep. <laughs> That's it, and we never work. Okay. And actually, I can tell you, you work a lot. Fiesta in Spain. and siesta. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah that, I didn't know that. I'm learning something new. Yeah. 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 So yeah, but as far as I know, marijuana is illegal. Illegal in. Uh, yeah, smoking weed is illegal in Jamaica, right? Yes, it has been illegal. It has been very illegal. Yeah. Um, up until quite recently, actually. Huh. And, um, you know, I'm telling you this story. Once I came from work and um, I went to a bar after work mm-hmm. and I was dressed pretty sharp. You know, I had a, I think I was wearing a white shirt tucked in, you know, clean shoes and everything and a very sharp mustache. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I came out of my car and I saw this dreadlocks, you know, and he had a fat joint. And when he saw me, he swallowed his joint. And the poor guy, he thought I was police. He thought I was a police. So Uh he he swallowed his joint. And what I saw come out of his nose was not smoke, but steam. 
Oh. And it was a little bit funny because I went to him and I said in my lowest, my best Jamaican, I said, wow, go on, big man, everything cool. You all right? You know, and he was surprised and a little bit embarrassed because he really did swallow his joint because he thought I was the police. Oh, my God. I have to tell you something, actually, <laughs> yeah. about Jamaica. Tell me. Mm -hmm. When I was a student, my first job, mm -hmm. I was in a, 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 as a barista. In a place called Jamaica Coffee Shop. <laughs> <laughs> we had such, like, honestly, we had the Blue Mountain Cafe. Uh -huh. I had to learn about the cafes, uh, varieties, and so on. Uh -huh. And um, it was super expensive. Uh -huh. I was always uh, kind of shaking every time I was, you know, asking like for a person to pay the coffee because mm -hmm. they were like, I think you made a mistake. I was like, no, that's the price of the coffee. Mm -hmm. And well, whenever I was saying that I I work in this Jamaica coffee shop, they had the wrong idea about what, what is the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what, what I'm doing. What you, were, what you were selling or why your coffee was so expensive. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, mm, yeah, there's oh, in nothing the Netherlands, to do with yes, this. in the Netherlands, was it? Hmm? No, that okay. was in Spain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, understand. yeah, but... This is uh, mental associations, right? Yes. You know, it's not necessarily bad. Mm -hmm. Not all the time. Because I said it's basically positive, but you have to manage that because this weed aspect, it's um, it's probably something that defines the life of the loudest Jamaicans, but it's not something that defines the life and the character of most Jamaicans. And that's far, far, far from the truth. I mean, uh, so there are a lot of people who who just don't, you know. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, not, it's not really a mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. And there are other things, you know, that people assume. Sometimes I, I don't take the fantasy away. Sometimes I dance with it. I run with it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to mm -hmm. think that, you know, I fart sunshine, <laughs> then it's okay. You know, yeah, you okay. know, I can, we can, we can, you know, talk mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to buy me a cocktail, um, of course I'll take the cocktail and I talk beautiful things. Yes. But, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have to take that fantasy away sometimes, which is, which is fine. It's okay. You know, mm -hmm. I don't have a car. That's a good thing about also becoming older. Yes. You, 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 you decide, you know, do you, is it my mission to change? everybody yes and correct everybody yes mm -hmm. no no if they want to think that's then you know mm -hmm. sure it's fine nice it's fine you know did you miss jamaica yes of course of course all the time mm -hmm. all the time all the time um but you know the more and more i live here the more i think that there will be things that i miss more about yeah here mm -hmm. and um yeah i'm like European now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still Jamaican though. Okay. Do you go often to Jamaica? Not enough. Mm. But um, yeah. Hmm. yeah I, I am in contact though. But mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm not living there. So. Yeah. Yeah, I know. We all expats um, experience this, even though it's not the same being from Jamaica than from Poland, living in Berlin, right? Yes. Um, good. What else? So you said you're going to cook, actually. I'm very curious about that, too. I'm going to cook. I'm, I'm cooking, actually, I'm cooking something typically Jamaican today. Wow. What and is this? And you will have the... It's a surprise. I don't want mm. everybody to know what my eating habits are. Okay. No, man, I'll, I'll make another show for that. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it will be interesting to know about, like, Jamaican food, to be honest. It's mm? a surprise for you. Oh. And I will... I'm I so will, honored. I will... Um, I will treat you today mm -hmm. as a note of gratitude for the wonderful interview. Beautiful. But yes. we're not done because I still have one last question. Really? Yes. And because, yeah, exactly, we're talking about photography because you're English coach, but you're also photographer. And I basically, yeah, I've seen your studio for podcasts and then we are going to move into the photography part right mm -hmm. and then you specialize also in, in dance photography mm -hmm. and my question for you actually I have few first of all you said you dance salsa do yes. you do you dance anything else <laughs> 
I dance freestyle and mm -hmm. I dance freestyle is then anything, mm -hmm. you know, in Germany, we might call that, um, well, actually freestyle is just anything. Yeah. And sometimes I do a little thing. The more I work with dancers, the less I dance actually, which is kind of sad, but, um, yeah, I can do a little bit of tango mm -hmm. and I can do merengue and I can, um, what else do I dance? That's pretty much it. The rest of it is as of Deutsch when we say so zucken, which is just a little bit, you know, like mm -hmm. little twitch. Mm -hmm. um, and but I wouldn't call myself a dancer, no. And then why, why did you come up with this interest of photographing dancers? Yeah, let me think about that. I I, I spent a lot of time working with dancers, and I will start by. By framing what I see dance as, what dance represents to me is it's a depiction of, of, of life. It means a lot of things to me. And, and, and you know, coming from me, who knows um, nothing about dance, really. I'm not any kind of dance authority. I know what I like and I know what I or how I can photograph certain different kinds of dance on stage. So... Again, not an authority, but I do recognize certain parallels with the imagery that dance presents us with. It kind of depicts the way we have to move through life, the way we have to evolve, the way we have to move and adjust to adapt to the way life is changing. Now, I can wax lyrical on dance forever yes uh but it is a conversation with myself that works for me and keeps me motivated and um it's good to be able to see different things in dance so why dance photography because it stimulates thought i like the idea of capturing the movement you know giving giving first of all i'm not really giving stage to the dance as such somebody else gives them a stage but i like to help to to immortalize some of the things they're doing because they're doing these things for a moment i have to capture these moments commit them to paper commit them to pixels and they're there forever theoretically i like doing that it is good for my brain because it's not so easy to follow a moving subject moving through different lighting scenarios, uh, adjusting your camera, your choice of lens, your settings to to adapt to the dancer who herself or himself depicts the kind of adaptation that we as human beings have to do moving through life. Like, for example, with this corona situation, mm -hmm. a lot of people have to learn, a lot of people have to learn um To accept online training, for example, a lot of people have to learn to do it. A lot of people have to change their business models. It doesn't mean that you're going to give up everything. You know, you're still grounded as a dancer is on the ground, you know, still affected by gravity. But you change your movement, you change your speed. And um, it is like an imagery. It, it just depicts the whole, it's, it depicts life. And that is that is what is stimulating to me. Yes, that is what makes it interesting to me. Um, most of the time I'm photographing dance, I'm really doing it for me. Sometimes people ask me to document their stage and that is their canvas. So I don't really bring my artistic inspiration to their art because I'm just documenting it. But sometimes I get the opportunity to create my own canvas and um, converse also with my camera and it's just good it's simulating some people do art some people do photography some mm -hmm. people do football some people do gaming some people do sports some people do different things my thing is just dance photography and i make no apologies for it it's a wonderful thing and there's more there's mm -hmm. more it has evolved to greater things even that i'm doing now okay i think something interesting you said it's about like like the movement no and mm -hmm. but uh, how it's capturing also the motion no Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, dancing mm -hmm. is ex basically expressing what you feel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's also like the, the passion and the, the expression of the face of someone, I think that will be challenging. 
Yes, 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 yes. You know, I shoot also for personality. I always, sometimes they use hashtag shoot for feeling. Yes, shoot for feeling mm -hmm. means that what really interests me is uh, not necessarily just the beauty. I, I, I want the expression. So, for example, one friend of mine who is into one kind of dance, she says, well, you know, um, modern dance is always about the anguish, you know, the pain, the strong passion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she finds that not so nice. And then another dancer will say, well, oh, you know, what she wants, she doesn't want to express anguish. She wants to express joy and she wants to express um, uh, a celebration of femininity and that kind of more delicate beauty on the stage. So she doesn't like modern dance. She does another kind of dance. Mm -hmm. And um, I I appreciate both, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, I don't make any judgment about the kind of expression anyone wants to communicate on the stage. I just change my settings. Mm -hmm. So I am adapting. It's the, the dance photography itself is a dance. Sometimes people ask me if I dance, I say only behind the camera. Mm -hmm. and, and in a way, it's kind of true because I'm changing my look and... Um, and and my approach to capturing these moments. So, what's your yeah. favorite dance? My favorite. My, for what? For for, for, well, oh. for different. <laughs> my favorite dance. I I honestly do not have a favorite dance. Okay. You know, to be honest, I do not. I have a I have a favorite kind of expression. I like to see people expressing and 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 um creating themselves and and and, and communicating with power and feeling whatever that feeling might be mm -hmm. right i also appreciate the beauty of it mm -hmm. you know so it's, it's it's an expression also of freedom that i i enjoy seeing because if i'm interacting with it i'm a part of it mm -hmm. you know so i really do not have a favorite dance mm -hmm. i don't okay i do dance few dances or like I try uh, the one I, I dance the most is swing dance and yes. uh, this is basically for me it's totally different and I enjoy a lot dancing swing but from time to time you know I miss dancing salsa because it's something different totally different so we have a, this group of friends who dance swing and um, yeah and we go well we used to <laughs> We used to go to uh, basically parties where we can dance. And, and so swing is, for example, for me, like joy, happiness, you know, it's like very, you can. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, by the way, when I say swing, the main one here where I'm talking about Shaq and Dindy Hop, mm -hmm. because inside of swing, there are so many different dances. Dindy Hop. Yeah. Um, another feeling is if you dance Balboa or, um, yeah, or blues, of course, it's totally different. Um, but yeah, like the, the normal, if you start dancing swing, the most normal thing is that you start with Lindy Hop. And this is, you know, like totally different dance. Where, like, if I dance salsa, it's more a bit more sexy or more sensual, which I also like. And I miss from the swing. Swing is basically zero mm -hmm. sensuality. Sex, well, like, really zero. Mm -hmm. uh, well, tango is, you know, another. Tango is a different level. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about like oriental dance you know mm -hmm. it's different and recently i uh, started classes of hip hop because now we have to dance something with no partner mm -hmm. due to mm -hmm. corona so yes. it's like okay hip hop hip hop is another kind of feeling it's like being angry you know like uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's totally defiant it's a defiant kind of feel sometimes it's, it's hip hop is actually quite political it's not i'm not yeah. talking about gangster rap no you know talking about you know f you know uh, yeah endowed women and gold and money and huh. bling that's not what i'm talking about I'm, the political aspect of it is is quite defiant actually mm. but yeah what i mean is also like every dance brings something of course you have like a million tons of varieties mm. but uh, yeah mm. and depending on the that's why we listen different musics, right? 
because depending on your mood, you will listen to a specific music or... And then your expression will be also different. Of course, of course. And um, yeah, basically it's interesting. Um, so it is. what is your... What is going to be your next project with dance photography? My next project with dance... Well, you know, um, for, for a long time in my life, I, th I think it was about four or five years ago, I went into a kind of a light depression and it had a lot to do with also the right wave that was taking the world along as along with some other things. There was sickness in the family and so on and so forth. So for me, dance was like um, an escape to sanity. So, you know, if any of my dancer friends are listening now, you know, I'm going to tell them thank you because I really did need that at that time. Mm -hmm. It was an escape to sanity that I needed. It was it was my connection to humanness mm -hmm. that was vital at the time because I felt as if the ignorant horde was rising. And, um, and uh, you know, I mean, I don't know how I would have survived if I didn't have that outlet that escape to sanity, as I explain it. Um, the my, my work with dance has evolved, whereas... You know, for actually, I started with um, flower photography, mm -hmm. and then I moved on to dance photography, mm -hmm. um, flowers to dance because you know, like the textures of flowers, the cost, the the textures of the petals, and then the I like the textures of the costumes, and then the movement started with oriental dance, which was a uh, an expression of well, feminine joy for the most part on the stage, which was kind of flowery, and uh, so I dived deeply into that and then it evolved into other dance forms the modern the contemporary which is nice you know a little ballet stronger lines different composition and so on a different feeling and then through the dance photography there was learning about light and and learning about light and working with movement led to videography which could be actually a better some people would say it's a better doing better justice to the art of movement, you know, with video instead mm -hmm. of with photography. Some people would argue that, you know, that's not true. It's about catching the the moment. And that could be true as well. I've caught a few moments in answering the question in a very German way, the way you like it. <laughs> no, I didn't say I like the German way. <laughs> the way you no like offense, it. No offense, Germans. <laughs> in answering the question. <laughs> As I said, I can wax lyrical and on, 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 on dance forever. And it's all true. That's the beautiful thing about art, you know. But, okay. The evolution from flower photography to dance, oriental dance photography to more ballet and modern to, mm. to, to videography, appreciation of light and sound and all of this stuff. I am now working a lot with videography mm -hmm. for training, which also has been something in the process since 2014. Mm -hmm. Since 2014, I got qualified as an online trainer. Mm -hmm. And back then it wasn't so much accepted. You know, people blocked it. And um, to cut a long short story short, now it's more accepted. No more people are doing it. I am happy that I have tons of experience with online training and I can incorporate videography into, into my training practice in a way that I would not have been able to do had I not learned about light through dance photography. Um, even what we're doing now with this podcast, mm -hmm. the videography kind of evolved into as of this whole work with media this is also part of it i don't know if i'll be podcasting had i not started with floor photography and dance photography i don't know mm -hmm. yeah so that is the evolution that's awesome uh, so from a um, dancer perspective or like a dance learner perspective i can tell you that we watch a lot of uh, videos to oh, learn yes. how to dance oh yeah i know I, what I'm you really do bad i know what you do uh, Oh, do you know what I do? Of course I, I know. I know what you, um, plural, do. <laughs> I know how videos work. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. Yeah. I'm, I'm really not a, the best student in this sense, but honestly, I have friends who are like, honestly, they watch so many videos mm -hmm. and they practice at home. And, mm -hmm. You know, like, um, yeah, it's, it's very cool. It works perfectly. And I'm mm -hmm. really happy again. I'm so happy that I... 
I, I dived into dance and I'm mm-hmm. thankful for it as well. And I'm also glad that I can frame mm-hmm. someone else's craft mm-hmm. in such a way that it kind of fits the mind because, you know, again, it's just creating a space for learning to happen. Mm-hmm. I don't really put knowledge into people's heads. They decide if learning happens on their own, but I put people into that space to use their language to do something. So it's a, it's a fantastic thing. And, um, it's happening. Also, it has happened. I think also uh, in terms of like learning languages and dancing, that's definitely a thing. You no, know, when we, I was saying like I'm a teacher too, so I know how important it is that you create an emotion to memorize really something, right? Because um, otherwise. Of course, you can you can remember everything, but if you connect things uh, and like an emotion, I I think basically you can really learn a language while you know do an act, an activity such as um, dancing. Now I'm thinking like also like swing dance. I'm exactly thinking about a, a song uh, where you can um, remember the steps. You know, so that's the way you remember the steps because you sing it and then you dance it. And that's the way why you are able to remember. Exactly. Be maybe a song to finish. As, the, a, as, a, as, a, as, as a trainer yourself, you, you know quite well. As a, mm. it, the, the best way to commit something to memory is if you create as many emotional mm. or sensory associations as you mm-hmm. can. We know quite well that a relationship works really well for learning a new language. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe it's because of the emotional aspect of it. And as you rightly said, there's a lot of emotion in dance. Mm -hmm. If you feel it, Mm -hmm. you don't forget it. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think it was Nina Simone. No, Maya Angelou who said someone might forget what you said to them, Mm -hmm. but they will never forget the way you made them feel. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I remember my dad telling me when I was a kid, oh my God, if you could remember the lessons the way you remember the, the lyrics of the songs. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot of languages, uh, so like, a lot of English through music, basically. Mm-hmm. A lot of people do. Hmm. A lot of people do. Yeah. So that's definitely something inspiring. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's basically how they teach in the kindergarten, right? right? Like, also, like, um, playing with, with music and, and sounds and so on. Yeah. I learned a lot from comedy, from German comedy and uh, satire. Mm-hmm. Okay. Satire. Yeah. Actually, because, yeah, I do have an interest in politics and, and um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, from songs, not so much, but mostly from, from art, nonetheless, which mm-hmm. is comedy and Satire, I learned a lot from mm-hmm. that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think we are, we can finish the podcast with a song. With a song. Well, it's I, Friday I'm, night, I'm, come I'm not, on. I'm not a singer. Uh, no, I, I'm I not. I don't sing. No. Oh, you want to sing? No way. <laughs> what are you talking about then? <laughs> no, I don't no, understand. No, no. I don't understand. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well. I mean, you are the editor, so you can play a song. I That's can play a why. song. All right, all right, That's all right. What I mean. You know, I'm glad that you mentioned that about music. And um, okay, now that I know that you don't want me to sing, I have a perfect idea. A friend of mine called Andy Beck released a book recently. He's been interviewed on this show at least, at well, twice already. And um, actually, there's one episode where he went into expressing his gratitude for the people in his social nets who have supported him, you know, during the release and so on. And he was also someone who helped me in the poetry series where we actually took some music from Jamaica, electro techno music from Jamaica, Mm -hmm. which is not usually expected. And we put on top of that some Irish folk music. Now, we're not going to go the techno this time, but I'm going to play Andy's song. So, do enjoy. Well, if some want to come to the Irish dance With fortune, fame and his luck to chance He'd have seen this life from a different stance He might well just have changed his plans But he sold his soul for land Well, I knew a man who worked in a bank His eyeballs set on the highest rank He worked so hard that he got the cramp Every time he had a drink He worked all day and all night They found him dead at 35 
society with someone rich Or was he satisfied less than you would think? But if someone had come to the Irish dance With much and fame and his luck to chance He'd have seen this life from a different stance He might well just have changed his plans But he sold his soul for a pension plan Well, I knew a chap who worked for the law The legal text made his eyeballs sore His dating skills, they were so poor That he never managed to chat The courtroom was his game Until the case he worked on failed He was someone who chucked himself in the lake And that was the end of that But if someone had come to the Irish dance With fortune, fame and his luck to chance He'd have seen this life from a different stance He might well just have changed his plans But he sold his soul for a witness stand So she strangled him with the kitchen cloth And now she's eating porridge But if someone had come to the Irish dance Watch and fame and a luck to chance She'd have seen this life from a different stance She might well just have changed her plans But now she's sewing mailing bags chap who worked in an office he was the boss so he made the novice bring him lots of cups of coffee Maltesers and toffee his computer crashed and so did the aircon the business never got airborne there he sits chained to a keyboard where the hell has my life gone but if someone had come to the Irish dance with fortune fame and his luck to chance He'd have seen this life from a different stance He might well just have changed his plans But he sold his soul for a wireless land And if they don't come to the Irish dance Fortune, fame and the luck to chance He'd have seen this life from a different stance They might well just have changed their plans But they sold their souls to the man Andy That was great Thank you. That was fantastic, man. <laughs> Thank you. That's one that's one that I wrote myself a few years ago.